we have our next speaker, Ruman Chaudhary. Ruman holds a degree in quantitative social science and has been practicing as a data scientist and an AI developer since 2013. Chaudhary is currently the global lead for responsible AI at Accenture Applied Intelligence. She was named one of BBC's 100 women for 2017 and honored to be inducted to the British Royal Society of Arts. Chaudhary serves as the co-chair of RSA's Citizen AI Jury and also serves on the board as an advisor for multiple AI startups. So, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about responsible artificial intelligence for humanity, please welcome on stage, Ruman. I love your hair, Ruman. Hi. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ruman, and I do artificial intelligence and ethics. So when you think about artificial intelligence, you probably think about something like this. Um, and I'm actually here to talk about not this, because this is actually not the face of artificial intelligence. You may be seeking a physical manifestation of AI, but in reality, AI looks more like this. It's something more mundane. It's something you hold in your hand every single day. It tells you how to get to work. It reminds you of your calendar schedules. It may autofill your emails for you. It may tell you what best restaurant to go to. And increasingly, it's guiding your life. For example, it's showing you what jobs you would be qualified for, maybe even who your babysitter or caretaker may be, and what your children should be doing. So when I think about artificial intelligence, I think about the everyday ways in which it's coming into our lives. So then why does technology need ethics? If we're just building apps, things on our phones, what is the need for ethical use? Well, often you'll hear about a conversation on bias. So what does that mean? How do we create, quote, unbiased algorithms? Well, there's actually two kinds of bias that we talk about. So as a social scientist, but also as a data scientist, I find that when people say bias, technical people and lay people, they actually talk past each other. There's a lost in translation moment. So when I put my data scientist hat on, I think about bias. I think about a measurable, quantifiable value. So there can be bias in your data, bias in reporting. So for example, if you go to any popular website and review a product, review a restaurant, there's really only two times you review something is when you love it or when you hate it. Right? Nobody goes onto a website and says, I had a very average experience. Right? So that all leads to bias in our data. And then finally, design bias. What are we assuming this AI can do? So for example, just because I put a face on a bunch of circuits does not make it human. Are we then assuming it is human because it talks back like a performing monkey? No. Right? So there's design bias in that our knowledge of AI often as lay people is so limited, we're not really appreciating what it cannot do. And interestingly, as data scientists, we make assumptions about our data and what it is measuring, and we forget, more importantly, what we cannot measure quantitatively. But when lay people talk about bias, just the average person, if I just put on my, my social scientist hat, people think of societal bias, isms, racism, sexism, right? Um, and you know, when I give this talk to more quantitative audiences, I read that next line twice. Data is not an objective truth. It is reflective of pre-existing institutional, cultural, and social biases. So one very common thing you will hear people say is, oh, well, the data says so. But the data did not form out of a bubble. The data does not come without context. The data comes because we as people have made decisions. And I think we can all agree, people make some very dumb decisions. We are often very inconsistent. We often lie. We can just be completely wrong. Or we are socialized into a behavior that tells us to say something or report something when in reality we do something differently. So my PhD is in political science. And interestingly, if you go and you ask Americans um, if they voted in the last election, approximately 80% will tell you, yes, I voted in the last election. We actually know in reality, based on true poll numbers, that number is less than 50%. So are 30% of people lying? It's actually often also cognitive dissonance. We want to have think we voted, so we will, in our heads, think that we did, and or if somebody asks us the question, we feel like to have been a good citizen, we should have voted, so we'll just give the socially acceptable answer. So what happens, so what happens when we use data that's like that, that is full of biases, conscious or unconscious? 
These are four types of what we call primary harms by this group called the Future Privacy Forum. So one is the loss of opportunity. In other words, um, denying jobs, denying housing, denying opportunities to people. Second is economic loss. So if we create preferential pricing, are we then putting the onus of additional pricing on some subgroup? Social detriment, in other words, reinforcing of stereotypes, lumping people together by their face shape to determine whether or not they are potentially harmful uh, terrorists. Um, and finally, the loss of liberty. In other words, making certain spaces that should be freely available to all online spaces, like Twitter or social media, for example, a hostile environment some in some individuals. So in this case, Amnesty International has been doing a lot of work to document abuse against women online, which, by the way, happens at an exponentially higher rate than it happens to men. But I'm here, actually, to talk not about primary harms, what I call secondary harms. So primary harms exist in the world in which we would say, you know, we can objectively agree it should not happen. Things that are influencing the outcome should not be influencing the outcome. So a trickier one to think about, which actually impacts an advertising audience, is the concept of secondary harms. So what is a secondary harm? Um, so a, a secondary harm is when something is not immediately denying something to somebody, but in the long term, downstream, it has negative effects. And often, again, these are th this is the trickier one to find because it's often reinforced by institutionalized biases. So this is a picture of something called the filter bubble. Um, and if you've heard of this term, it has to do with how our media is curated towards us. And it's curated towards us in a way where it wants to optimize clicks. Now, when we think about news outlets, in other words, they are not optimized, their algorithms are not optimized to educate us, to give us a diversity of opinion, to inspire thoughtfulness. What they are actually meant to do is make you click. And what are the things that make you click? Things that support exactly what you believe. And actually, in expectation, start to move you more towards radicalization. How? So we have this bubble, right, that I'm living in, and I think that literally the whole world thinks like me. Why? Because whenever I log on, I am just seeing things posted by people who talk like me, who think like me, and I'm not exposed to a diversity of thought. Second, and actually worse, when I meet somebody who has a counter opinion to mine, I think they're crazy because in my world, nobody shares their opinion. So we are living in a world of increasing political polarization all around the world. One can say there is a link to the filter bubble and increasing political polarization. If you'd wanted to guess how long we've been in the filter bubble, over 10 years. The book, The Filter Bubble, was written a decade ago. So we can literally imagine that no two people in this room have viewed the same reality. And to be fair, we never have, but now it is being algorithmically shaped for us. It is harder and harder to push out of it. I'll give you, I'll give you another example of algorithmic determinism happening. So this is an image used by KFC um, in China. And they co-created this product where it would look at your face, it would assess you based on your age, your gender, and actually your attractiveness, whatever that means, and give you what it think you should order. So what's the problem? You know, it's, it's like a cute novel example, again, just some fun advertising to get people laughing, maybe taking pictures and posting on social media. But I will tell you what the problem is. This is directly pulled from the press release. So if you were a male customer in your early 20s, you'd be offered a chicken sandwich and a Coke, and a female customer in her 50s would be offered por porridge and soybean milk for breakfast. And there are some really strong assumptions being made here about what men should eat and what women should eat and how they should act and look and think and dress and even be seen in public. So this is algorithmically determined. So if any of you work in design, you work with them, uh, user experience people, you know the term friction. So what you want to create in any user experience is a frictionless experience. This is why it's so easy to open Twitter and just jump right in. This is why it's so easy to comment, click, etc. What we are doing here is introducing friction. It's social friction. It's friction introduced in a way to tell you you are wrong if you are not working exactly like the norm. So in other words, if you are a woman in your 50s and you know what, you want a crispy chicken sandwich, you walk up to this, it tells you you should have porridge and soybean milk, right? Friction number one. You then have to say no, because you're allowed to say no, obviously, they're not forcing you to eat this food, right? So you say no. The next thing it does is it shows you a menu that is algorithmically designed based on what it thinks you would want. 
So then you would have to sit through row after row of salads, right, cereal, not the thing you actually want. And again, additional friction. Every single time you have to wave through the menu, you are being reminded that who you are is wrong, your individuality is wrong, what you think is wrong, and you should actually just shut up and get in line because you're holding it up right now. So this fiction is really problematic because it pushes us into gendered stereotypes, racial stereotypes, and I don't even know what the attractiveness part is about. So I'm gonna give you one last one example that's actually a lot scarier and close to home for myself living in the US. There's a company that is giving away facial recognition technology to schools for free in order to identify school shooters. Now this is not, it's going to identify when a child is pulling out a gun. It's saying that we can determine, based on aberrant behavior, who may turn into a shooter. Now this is personally to me very frightening. It is frightening because children should be allowed to explore their own individuality. They should be who they are. Just because you are not exactly like everybody else does not mean you will then go pull out a gun and shoot people. And really, can facial recognition technology even identify this? We're trying to quantify and measure something that is so intangible, so qualitative. We cannot shove everything into a measurable, pixel-related value. So what do we mean when we say someone's going to evolve into a school shooter? And what is a problem child if they haven't actually done anything yet? And as we move into prediction, and again, for those of us in advertising in the room, there's a lot of predict, it's not just prediction, right? It is now prescribing. And when you prescribe something, you actually start nudging behavior towards that direction. So when we say, oh, we've identified a problem child, that child gets pulled out of their classroom, pulled into the principal's office, sent to counseling. If any of you have been to high school, it's not always the friendliest place. That child is now ostracized. Everybody knows that they're the weird kid. They get treated accordingly, and we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the term algorithmic determinism, from a quantitative perspective, is measurement bias plus feedback loop. So measurement bias means what you think you're measuring is not exactly what you are measuring. It is actually some other value. So I think I am measuring aberrant behavior or what someone's going to order. It's actually not the case. And a feedback loop is a structure that causes output to influence its own, in, sorry, causes the output to influence its own input. So in other words, I pull out a problem child from a classroom, treat them like a problem child, then they start acting up, and then I say, oh, clearly they were going to be a problem child, good thing I caught that, when actually what I've done is I've nudged somebody towards that behavior. So if you think about how an algorithm works, we take data, we put it into a model, what that model actually does is approximates a pattern. And that's fine if we were just doing pure prediction. But now we are doing prescriptive analytics, right? We are nudging behavior. I will show you something based on what I think you will order. Guess what? It increases your likelihood of ordering it. So now we are involved in the shaping of that future pattern of data. And what we are doing is actually trying to nudge people towards fitting that pattern rather than using that pattern as, an, as a seemingly objective measurement of what people's behavior is like. So another example I'm going to use is something that we're seeing all around the world, this concept of predictive policing. So what that means is we take historical crime data and we um, deploy police officers into these spaces by, by, you know, based on what we think the dangerous neighborhoods are. And then these police officers go and they go catch criminals, presumably, right? So there's a few problems with that. So remember I said measurement bias plus feedback loop, right? When we measure crime, we don't actually measure the true rate of crime. We measure the number of criminals caught, people arrested. And all around the world, we know this is not done in an objective fashion. This is often done in a discriminatory fashion. And then the feedback loop happens. Well, I determine some neighborhood X is a dangerous neighborhood. I send out the cops, and guess what they do? They do their job, and they catch criminals. And then I say, great, my algorithm has worked. So when we think about ourselves as technologists, what is our role in this? What do we do? And I use a term called moral outsourcing. So moral outsourcing, and this is why I am so against the anthropomorphizing of artificial intelligence, the slapping of a face on a bunch of circuits. These are the kinds of headlines we'll see. AI robots are sexist and racist. How to avoid racist algorithms. I actually could not tell you how to do that because as I pointed out, by being in our phones, by being behind the scenes when we go online, or apply for a job, we actually don't have any control over it. We actually cannot avoid these algorithms. So I take a step back and I think through another time in history where we wondered the same thing. 
right? So now we're, we're, we're creating these anthropomorphized robots, and we've decided that these robots are evil, and what are we gonna do? So myself as a technologist living in San Francisco, living in Silicon Valley, we act as if we are not responsible for this. So we, we did this a long time ago as well. At the end of World War II, all around the world, people wondered how did people become complicit in the attempted genocide of an entire people? One philosopher, Hannah Arendt, um, tried to study this, and she came up with this term called the banality of evil. We like to think evil is a, is a human, a face, a thing, an object, some objectively evil being. But Hitler does not come to power on Hitler alone. Hitler has an entire pyramid supporting him and his processes and his thoughts, and he has to have armies of people. And most importantly, he has to have people that are simply complacent. They are just agree to go along with it because, you know, that's what the data said, and what am I supposed to do anyway, and how am I supposed to fix or solve this, right? So what he saw, uh, sorry, what Hannah Arendt saw when looking at Nazi trials in Jerusalem was over and over they would say the same thing. They would say, well, you know, I didn't kill the Jews. I just, you know, um, signed the orders for gas tanks. Well, what did you think those gas tanks were going towards? Right? So what we saw were people complicit in an organization and in the institution who helped facilitate and helped actually create this bad outcome. So going back to the concept of predictive policing, there was a paper presented at a conference where they talked about the use of predictive policing. And when somebody asked them, asked the, the, um, the presenter, well, you know, can you see how this could go wrong? They said, I'm not sure how this could be used. I am just an engineer, right? And it's not my response. I just build the thing. Other people use it, other people deploy, but that is simply just not true. So moral outsourcing is a term that I use. And the way I define it is how we anthropomorphize artificial intelligence to blame negative consequences and shift it from the human to the algorithm. So this is why literally in our language, we'll say the AI is sexist and the AI is racist. That is simply not true. We have built it based on this data. We have built it based on these assumptions, we as in human beings. And then when it goes out there and does exactly what we programmed and created it to do, why should we be surprised? We actually should not be. So what's the problem with moral outsourcing? So, so selfishly speaking as a technologist, this could mean that I can just do what I want, right? I can create what I want, program what I want, put it out there, and then when bad things happen, say, oops, sorry, right? But I, I will also, by the way, point out that whenever we have a massive victory, a massive win, we don't say artificial intelligence, um, per, you know, uh, uh, beats Lee Sedol in the game of Go. We actually say DeepMind creates an algorithm that does this. So it's, we have very, we have very um, careful and nuanced language switching. When it's a good outcome, we give ourselves the credit. When it's bad, we actually switch it to the algorithm, right? So that, what's the problem with moral outsourcing? Well, the problem with it is that it actually drives the fearful narratives we have today. The idea of mass joblessness, this Terminator idea that we're gonna have killer robots coming out of the sky, coming to life, that they're sentient, that they're talking to us, that they have will and feeling, right? But then you think about it, how, how have we constructed this world? So as I mentioned, you know, linguistically, we put ourselves out of the sentence when we say things like, the AI is sexist or racist, right? And then number two, we have also, and again, because we switch our language about it, not only said it's anthropomorphized, it's human-like, it's making thoughts and decisions, but we've also decided those thoughts and decisions are evil. So this is why we have our Terminator ideology. This is why we have our fear of robots having to give us change just so we can eat. And again, that image is, is so salient because it's this picture of a physical being when, frankly, that is not how artificial intelligence looks today or will look in any time in the near future. And the things we need to think about and worry about are actually the invisible AI, the AI that, that slowly nudges us and pushes us towards a particular way of acting or being or thinking or looking. So with this, I leave you with a few thoughts. Number one, think about the artificial intelligence nudges in your life, right? So who, how are you being pushed and guided? And is that actually what you want? And number two, for all of you who are working in advertising, think about how when you classify, categorize, and put people into categories, whether we call it high-value customers or low-value customers, we think about that these are not fixed categories. These are not who you are inherently. 
what you can do is actually think about how to use artificial intelligence, deploy it intelligently, so that you can move people upwards to improve people's lives and use the AI as background to enable people to be their best selves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roman. Uh, we've got two questions for you. We'd sure. be grateful if you could answer them for us. So Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, talks about cognitive bias or the anchoring bias. And yep. since you spoke about the school, of, uh, the school facial recognition tech loop, mm -hmm. how can we sensitize users about biases while acknowledging existence of bias impact trusting AI-led technology? It's very echoey, so I'm having a hard time hearing your question, so I'll just Sorry, come closer to you. No worries. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Daniel Kahneman, uh -huh. in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow Talks, mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. cognitive bias or anchoring bias. How can we sensitize yeah. users? That's, that's, that's such an excellent question. Can I hold this? Thank you. Sure. Uh, that's yeah. the other one. Okay, perfect. Um, what an excellent question. So um, Kahneman's work is really great, but actually not, not just Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, there's a piece about risk aversion and people's decision making and you know why people don't change their minds very quickly about things because there's a buffer of risk aversion that's that actually ends up shaping our decision making. Um, but yes, cognitive bias and anchoring bias. So with school facial recognition, um, how can we sensitize users about biases? I think there's a, an important part here, and you know the the answer that we will give in industry is this concept of human in the loop. Um, but even that is, you know, a kind of a problematic way of thinking about it. Allegedly, we create algorithms because humans don't make objective decisions, but then we say algorithms are biased and we put a human on top of it, right? Um, and actually, there are papers that are now showing that when you do that, human beings actually regress back to their biased uh, behaviors. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of ways to think about teaching people about bias. So, um, you know, I think there is just a lot of need for in-depth understanding of the context in which things are applied. I think the biggest thing for data scientists to think about, AI engineers to think about, is measurement bias. Are you actually measuring the thing that you think you are, and what are the biases that can come in? One can also draw a lot from cyber, the cybersecurity world. So um, I, I always jokingly say that if I do my job correctly, then nothing happens. And cybersecurity somewhat is the same way, right? So the expected outcome is no extreme outcome. But what they do in cybersecurity is they create like red teams. So they create teams of people whose job it is to try to break the system. And I think something like that is actually quite necessary in artificial intelligence. Right? How do you create, how do you break your own system? How do you test it for the edge cases? Because what will happen, by the way, when you talk about biases, biases tend to disproportionately impact minority populations. So yes, the average person probably will not be harmed, but that's actually not what matters. Right? If we live in an inclusive society, everybody should be treated equally and fairly and justly. In order to do so, we actually need to think about edge cases. So when we sensitize users about biases, there is this level of education that needs to happen for data scientists. But thinking about the lay public, this is why it's so important to demystify AI. It is not a magical thing. It is not this black box that performs all of our tasks for us. It is actually also not beyond our comprehension. It is well within our comprehension. So, thinking, so demystifying, making it less of a magic tool for regular use and for data scientists, being very cognizant about the context in which your, your algorithms are applied, and also thinking about how your data is collected and measured. Um, and your first question, yes. Yep. And then there's the other yeah, question. Yeah, would you like to read it for us? Since sure, I'll just, I'll just read it, thanks. Thanks. Um, so the question is, think, considering that a lot of work in AI is either done for military or for selling stuff, that's hardly AI for good, is that not bad foundation? And hence, on a lighter note, are we then doomed if it comes to AI versus humans? Um, so I'll answer the second one first. Um, well, if it's AI versus humans, humans would have had to have created the AI, so why not just stop the humans that was going to make the AI in the first place? Um, so no, we're not doomed unless we're all just that stupid. <laughs> so um, military or selling stuff, uh, agreed. Um, so by the way, I will make a distinction. So my colleague, Sanjay Potter, also works at Accenture, will be talking today, if he hasn't already, about AI for good. 
And we have a very strong arm at Accenture that does AI for good. And this is thinking about charitable uses of artificial intelligence, a very noble cause. So how do you create AI to help the blind read? How do you create artificial intelligence to give people identities who are like refugees? And these are all very noble causes. My work is actually different. My work is on the everyday AI that we use and how to create it to be more fair when used in society. Um, so yes, while advertising, et cetera, is not AI for good, that's not really the intention here. The intention here is to say, we have a technology, and this technology can bring us amazing gains, efficiency gains, growth gains as organizations. Um, and as, as we do so, um, you know, we, we need to, it's not that it's bad foundation or it's not AI for good, we need to create it so that we're actually improving people's lives with the technology by giving them the things they want and they need. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very, very much for answering our questions room. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to request uh, Mr. Rohit Ohri to kindly present Ms. Chaudhary with a memento of gratitude. Welcome, Ms. Ohri. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Chaudhry, thanks a lot.